Welcome to the About Sex Podcast, where we discuss... Dairy products. Uh, yeah. No, <laughs> it's sex. We talk about <laughs> sex. My name is Josh, and with me, as always, is my lovely wife, Angela Skirtu. Tell uh, us who you are, Angela. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and an ASEC certified sex therapist. And today, our guest is uh, Barry McCarthy. And um, we can read all of his books. So he is the author of 14 books. He's received the Masters and Johnson Award for Lifetime Contributions to the Sexuality Field in 2016. Author of Sex Made Simple, Rekindling Desire, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Sexual Dysfunction, Sexual Awareness, Therapy for Men After 60, Developing Your Couple Sexual Style, Men's Sexual Health, and many more. We could go through so much. Yeah, many, we, many awesome books. We could go through so many, almost 14 <laughs> of them, actually. I know, there are 14 books. Yeah. We should get into the content. Hi, Barry. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing fine. Glad to be here this morning. Yeah, thanks for joining us. <laughs> So you wanted to start out talking about the good enough sex model. Yeah, right? tell us about the good enough sex model, Barry. Well, when I got into the field, which was way back in 1969, the notion was that the key for sexual function was erections, intercourse, and orgasm, and things being predictable and in control. Wait, isn't that the key, Wait. though? <laughs> isn't that really the key, though? I mean, like, that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> I'm all in favor of erections, intercourse, and orgasm, but no, that is not the key sexually. I'm also right. in favor of those. <laughs> well, okay, tell us so what the key is. The same page. <laughs> okay. The key sexually is sexual desire. Yeah. That you want to anticipate being sexual, that sex is really a, a combination of being responsible for your own sexuality and being an intimate sexual team. It's a one two combination. And desire is the core issue sexually. And that one of the things that builds desire is this anticipation of enjoying yourself sexually rather than seeing it as a pass-fail sexual test. And that's the thing that gets people into so much trouble, both men and women. Well, what's an example? view intercourse and, or, and erection as a pass-fail individual performance. What's an example of it looking like a pass-fail performance? Do you have a story or something? Well, the best thing, the story of all is the idea that when you look at men over 40 who are in a relationship, whether it happens once every 10 times, once a month, or once a year, he's not going to get an erection sufficient for intercourse. And the worst thing he does when that happens is he apologizes or he panics. Rather than turning toward his partner and saying, this isn't going to be an intercourse night, but let's make this a good time sexually. Let's share pleasure, let's be sensual, let's be erotic in terms of being turned on and orgasmic without intercourse. Right, but instead he panics, which is what I thought I'm supposed to do. Right? <laughs> That's what most men do, uh, yeah. right? <laughs> you panic. That's exactly right. Most men do not buy good enough sex because good enough sex, and most women find good enough sex a very positive, inviting concept. Yeah, the concept of good enough sex is that the essence of sexuality is sharing pleasure and sharing pleasure as a couple. And using and your entire body, yeah? Like it's like your whole body can be a sexual body. organ. <laughs> right, that your whole body is, and that the key to sexuality is not a performance. The key to sexuality is sharing pleasure and sharing eroticism. And that sex has a number of roles, meanings, but also a number of outcomes. And ultimately, the thing that predicts being sexual in your 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s is embracing good, the good enough sex approach. Mm. So mm. when people aren't kind of embraced, like what are some of the challenges you face in trying to get people to really accept it? Because I definitely have seen it in my office where people are like, what? Good enough? No, it's got to be great all the time. <laughs> great enough. It's got to be great, right? It's got to be tens, right? <laughs> you know, I think one of the hardest concepts, but also I think one of the most empowering concepts is the idea that the best couple sex is mutual and synchronous. And that means that each partner feels desire, each partner feels pleasure, each partner feels eroticism, including orgasm, and each partner feels satisfied. And satisfaction is much more than orgasm. But if you look at the typical couple who've been together two years or longer, they very much mutual, value mutual synchronous sex. But most of their sexual experiences are positive, but they're asynchronous. And that means it's better for one partner than the other. And for couples under 40, typically, the sex is better for the man than the woman. But one of the most interesting things 
is if for couples over 65, the sex tends to be better for the woman than the man. Hmm. And so couples who embrace both synchronous and asynchronous sex are in great in great shape. So why is it understand, why is it after sixty five that the women have the more positive sexual experience? Well, I think because this whole idea of variable flexible sex, which is the way most women learn to be sexual. So even for instance, women who are, have really good sexual voices in terms of desire, pleasure, eroticism, and satisfaction. Less than 15% of women are orgasmic 100% of the time. The great majority of women learn to be orgasmic in a variable, flexible way. And if the average well-functioning woman is orgasmic 70% of the time, not 100%. If mm-hmm. sex were just about orgasm, nobody would have couple sex, not men or women. You'd masturbate. Right. Masturbate. Because it's easier to get your you orgasm like, through masturbation. Right. <laughs> and in fact, healthy men and women masturbate on occasion. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, I agree with that. (laughs) But the great advantage of couple sex is that you're really playing it as a team. Now, what happens after 65 is that the woman feels valued and needed in a way that she didn't in her 20s and 40s. So the sex to her feels more genuine, more human, more interactive. And the other thing that's fascinating if you look at people who stay sexual under 60s, 70s, and 80s is that one of the things that men learn to do is they learn to piggyback his arousal on her arousal. Mm-hmm. And that's really valuable. So couples who are older might have less frequent sex, but they have more satisfying sex. They really feel better about themselves as a sexual couple, especially the woman. Well, I think to be sexual that like in later in life too, you really have to develop a confidence in your body and yourself, you know, like um, what I've seen with ladies, at least in my office that aren't having good sex later on is that there's a lot of con- self-confidence issues and a, a, like kind of difficulty kind of coming into themselves sexually. But I wonder what you see like in terms of, you know, who's having the better sex when they're getting older. <laughs> Let's talk about the healthy things first before the problematic things. All right, we'll talk about healthy stuff. We'll do what you want to do. We'll do do what you want to do, Barry. (laughs) The the, the thing that is so good about healthy sex is is that this new sexual mantra, both partners, and this is, by the way, true of gay couples and lesbian couples and partnered couples, not just married couples, they, they use the same language. They talk about the importance of desire, talk about the importance, the crucial importance of pleasure, the idea that eroticism is integrated in who they are as sexual people and a sexual couple, and that the issue with satisfaction is you feel better about yourself as a sexual woman or a sexual man, and you feel more energized and bonded as a couple. That's what healthy sex is about. And that one of the best measures, the best understanding about healthy sex is when you have a mediocre or dissatisfying or dysfunctional sexual experience, Rather than panicking or apologizing, you turn towards your partner and say, we're still intimate neurotic allies. Let's have a good time here. Yeah, Mm -hmm. you can still have a good time. It's not going to be perfect, but it's good enough. Well, the point is that you're more focused on the pleasure. So regardless of what you do, you're focusing on how do we both enjoy ourselves and feel good. And as long as you do that, it's a good experience. It doesn't matter if you get a perfect erection or a perfect orgasm. Although it's nice. <laughs> Is there ever a perfect you know, that's orgasm? That's why I'm so in favor of mutual erection. synchronous sex. But the people who really thrive are the people who can accept asynchronous sex. The couples who can accept that. Mm-hmm. And the people who ultimately crash and burn are the ones who think of it as an individual pass-fail performance. That kills sexual desire, ultimately. So when you're talking about asynchronous asynchronous sex, that's a hard word to say. Asynchronous. Um, (laughs) Yes, right? Um, You're talking about like sometimes sex also just being about one person getting their fulfillment, being a part of that as a a supportive partner? Right, that's part of it. And part of it is an understanding that it's okay to have a different experience sexually. You're not clones of each other. So for some people... The key in, this, in that sexual encounter is having an orgasm as a tension reducer. And for the partner, the key is feeling emotionally connected. People who understand that there's different roles, meanings, and outcomes sexually mm-hmm. have a much healthier sexual desire 
and sexual satisfaction pattern. Interesting. Okay. Did you want to ask? <laughs> so um, one of the things that we were, you talked about a little bit earlier was erections. And when guys are experiencing erectile dysfunction, would you go into a little more about what happens there and how men can, I don't know, how they can work through some of that? Okay. The, the most important is to normalize it. Okay. That the average man, by the time he reaches 45 or 50, has had at least one experience where he doesn't have an erection sufficient for intercourse. And when they, after that occurs, he almost never goes back to autonomous sexual function. He can really enjoy sex more. He can be a great lover. He can really value the couple's sex. But it, it's no longer an autonomous experience, totally unselfconscious. That what he has to adopt is this new approach. And part of that new approach is him being open to not only giving stimulation, but receiving stimulation. That giving and receiving pleasure-oriented touching is the key sexually. And that one of the exercises that we do with men, and, you know, I, we've done it with over 5,000 men. We've never done it with a man who's enjoyed the exercise, but it's a crucial exercise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yet it, it's called never... the waxing and waning of erections. That's great. And that is when he gets an erection. He's never enjoyed it. <laughs> stop stimulation and the erection will wane if he stays comfortable relaxed mindful conscious the erection will wax again let it wane a second time and go to intercourse on your third erection all men that i know personally clinically professionally every different way they have a strong preference and that strong preference is to go to intercourse on their first erection Mm -hmm. And it's a great preference. It's a terrible mandate. It's a wonderful preference. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it doesn't put a lot of pressure on the sex. <laughs> you're always one experience away from feeling like a failure. Mm -hmm. And it's a terrible way to lead, live. And when I say to my male clients is, you know, if your penis could talk to you, your penis would say, you've got to treat me better than this. <laughs> <laughs> so anxious. And I'm always afraid of being embarrassed. Yeah. And yeah. all the physical abuse. Yeah. <laughs> You're always hitting him so hard. <laughs> oh, gosh, gosh. No, but, like, it's true. I, I say that to guys in my office, too. I'm like, you are really mean to your penis, man, you know? Like, because they do. They put so much pressure on him. And that's not how, like, if that were a person and you were putting that much pressure on a person, of course they'd buckle under all that pressure. <laughs> So you know, I also blame the drug companies. Oh, yeah. But we all you do. Know, I generally, I think Cialis, <laughs> for most St. Louis folks, is a better drug than Viagra. And why and the is reason that? for that is not because it's more effective. That's a, that's a lie that the Cialis ads make. It's because it's easier to integrate into their couple sexual style. You get a window of opportunity to be sexual 30 minutes to 30 hours. But the notion that drug companies lie because in the, in the ads, everybody gets goes back to autonomous erections like they did at 21. Mm -hmm. And it's mm. just not true. So they're selling false even hope. The best people, right, even the best people, even if it's only once a year, it's usually going to be more than that, are not going to get an erection sufficient for intercourse. Mm. The drug ads overpromise and lie. So it... You were talking about the waxing, waning thing. It, do you think that's – is that a treatment for uh, erectile dysfunction? Like if you're having erectile dysfunction, should you get an erection while you're being aroused and making out and let it go down and then wait for a second or a third one to start penetration? Well, that would be a good thing to learn because the way to understand the wax and wane exercise is an anti-panic approach to sex. Uh. The, 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 most, the worst thing that men do is they panic or apologize. It's so anti-erotic. <laughs> so let's say you're having sex and you start well, to get an uh, erectile dysfunction. Okay, so you lose, the, your erection, you lose your erection. You lose your erection. So sufficient not, enough to right, go it's to not, divorce. So should you try to fight it? Should you try to like 
do more stimulation, or should you just let it lie and move on to something else, move to oral, move to massaging, doing something else, and let it sit for a bit? Uh, the more you have a number of alternatives, the better off you are. Yeah. But let me give you the best alternative. And that is, if he, if he does not have an erection sufficient for intercourse, he says that to his partner, that I'm not hard enough to go inside. Let's play some more, and will you guide intermission? In other words, allow her to decide if he's firm enough to go inside of her. And what he does is that he's involved in both giving and receiving stimulation. Now, this is a really important thing, point for men. The major reason that men fail with Viagra is as soon as he gets an erection, think about arousal on a 10-point scale. Zero is neutral, 10 is orgasm. And four or five is when you get an erection. He rushes to intercourse as soon as he gets an erection because he's afraid it won't be firm enough to go inside of her. One of the most valuable of all the techniques is don't transition to intercourse until your subjective arousal is a seven or an eight, mm -hmm. until you really turned on. Okay. So this something that paused. Interesting. One second. We're having a little. And the worst thing you do is when you start losing an erection, you rush to intercourse, or the woman, your partner, tries to manually orally stimulate you so you're able to get have an intercourse. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not subjectively aroused and you're receiving manual and oral stimulation, it's going to be a turn off rather than a turn on. Uh -huh. If your subjective arousal is five, six, seven, it'll be a turn on. If your subjective arousal is low, it's going to be a turn off. So let's explain that though. So Why is it a turn off? Is it? The, I want to explain that. So like the subjective arousal is what's going on in your brain, how you're feeling about the situation, not your physiological arousal of the erection. And so what? What, there's, what he's speaking about there, and you can clarify on this more, is that like when, when the guy kind of freaks out and panics when that erection goes down, there's nothing uh, subjectively arousable, or, or arousing, arousing about that experience. Right. It knocks you out it entirely. It kind of knocks you out of it. So it's better to go back in with like, all right, let's get my mind in the game, get excited about sex again. And then when my brain is at like a six or a seven or eight, that's when I'm more interested in getting back in. Would that, would that be how you put it? Or why don't you clarify too? That's a great way yeah. I think that's a reading on target. Yeah, exactly. Because I think guys really struggle with the subjective arousal part. They really see it as a physiological thing, and that's why they go in for that. Um, they're like, oh, maybe we should go to oral. Maybe we should touch it more. But their brain is completely turned off, and it's almost like they're numb down there at that point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, well, even, it's worse than being numb. It's, it's being self-conscious. There is nothing – I really want to repeat this. There's nothing more anti-erotic for both men and women than self-consciousness. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. It's anti-pleasure. So smart. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's like when you get in your head. It's funny. One person I know recently said you can only think with one head at, at a time. <laughs> so, like, you can't think with this – like, you're, you can't be um, thinking with this head about, like, oh, my God, I'm self-conscious. I'm thinking about all these things. And then the erection's just – that head's just not going to work out the way it should. <laughs> right. Okay, so I have a question. You know, one of the things that's interesting about good enough sex is that women embrace it. Uh, a couple therapists often embrace it. It's very hard for men, for male groups, for drug companies, and male physicians to embrace good enough sex. Yeah. The, the theme is that what makes a man a man is totally predictable erections. What was your and, question, and babe? That's not the right that. model. It's, <laughs> it really is an anti-male, anti-sexual model. So, so you were talking about um, when you're at like a, a lower end of arousal that manual or oral stimulation will be more of a turn off. Is that because you're, you'll be in your head or is there actual physical sensitivity that's different when you're less aroused that might cause it to go the other way? Well, think about it positively first again. What happens in good sex is you feel comfortable and aware. You're into both giving and receiving pleasure-oriented touching. 
you build a sense of arousal and erotic flow, which easily transitions to intercourse and orgasm. That's healthy sex. Mm -hmm. What happens with unhealthy sex is that it becomes this self-conscious individual performance. You're not really taking in pleasure and you're not giving pleasure either. It's all about trying your hardest to get turned on. And that, and paradoxically, is a turn off. Sex is not about work to prove anything to anybody about anything. <laughs> Wait, we're not trying to prove ourselves to each other? I've been doing this all wrong. <laughs> I'm there to show you how hard I am. <laughs> <laughs> You're so hard, baby. <laughs> I go hard or I go home. <laughs> That's the way it works. Now that makes or, sense. Or good enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, so there's, you want to hit this next topic here too? Yeah, so uh, you mentioned earlier a little bit about um, male-female sexuality equality, I think it was. Yeah, well, what, we're supposed I, to have equality? Yeah, What's that mean? <laughs> How do you well, have... Generally, when most people learn about sex, you know, I still teach undergraduates, so I teach 20, 21-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And it... Adolescence and young adulthood is where there is so much difference between men and women sexually. And one of those major differences is this idea for most women, again, not all women, but for most women, sex is a interactive process and it's a variable process. For most men, sex is a highly predictable, autonomous performance process. Ultimately, when it comes to adult sexuality, there's many more similarities and differences between women and men. And that's the idea of instead of the traditional double standard that men are all about eroticism and intercourse frequency, women are about intimacy and warm, touchy-feely things, mm -hmm. the healthy, the female-male sexual equity model says there are many more similarities and differences. And the biggest thing is both the woman and the man value intimacy, pleasuring, and eroticism. It isn't a war that you know women are from Venus and men are from Mars. It's absolute nonsense. I know it sold a whole lot of books and back in the 80s. There's no science to it at all. No, she's from St. Louis. Uh, what? <laughs> from St. Louis? Not Venus? Yeah. Thanks. It's good to know, Josh. <laughs> no, no, it's true, but I think there are a lot of people, you know, like there's some stereotypes to females and males that like I get I guess put into extremes in a book like that right. and people just kind of assume I mean, I think they do sometimes come in, in the therapy room in those extremes at times, but when you actually get them into that place, like you're saying, well, more that healthy sexual equity model, they're both engaging in both. They both want the eroticism. They both want the intimacy. I've had plenty of men say, I just want to be cuddled. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And it's fine. You know, one of the things I think that is so interesting with female sexuality, because there's really been a revolution in the last let's say 15, 18 years, comes out of Canada. The Canadians do sex so much better than we Americans do sex. It's I hear they're nicer too. <laughs> it forces them for, by giving them the research studies, some money for doing research. But the biggest issue is this understanding that female sexuality is not inferior to male sexuality, that it's more individualistic, it's more variable and flexible, it's more complex, but it's not second class, it's not inferior. And that her sexual voice is as important as his sexual voice. And that rather than it be only about intimacy and pleasuring, she also has her erotic voice, she also has her orgasmic voice. But the big thing to understand, and this is not true of all people, right, but it's true for the majority, is the major anti-erotic thing that happens to an adult woman is where she is being passive in foreplay. Where mm -hmm. the man is more turned on and, and he's trying to do breast and vulva stimulation to turn her on, to get her to catch up with him. Mm -hmm. And that is really not good for female or couple sexuality. No, you got to have both members active in some way. You can't just lay back. But and you, This idea, even when they're doing what's called self-entrancement arousal, where one partner's a giver, one partner's a receiver, the receiving partner is not passive. Mm -hmm. The receiving partner is aware and mindful and is open to what's going on and will guide what's going on. Passivity for most women is anti-erotic. It's mm -hmm. the major thing that interferes with her 
desire, pleasure, eroticism um, pattern. And I think it transfers to the partner as well. You can tell when your partner's being passive, and it definitely takes you out of it. It's kind of like being a dead fish, right? And you just yeah. kind of lay there on the bed. Nobody wants to have sex with a dead fish. I mean, <laughs> well, I hope not, but some people might. You never know. <laughs> some people do. I mean, you know, a major sexual complaint in the United States in 2018 is secondary desire problems, but it's not just with women, it's with men too. Yeah. And desire problems are more common than anxiety and depression combined. It's the most common mental health problem in the United States. So how would you define a desire problem? Is that somebody just has no interest in sex at all? No, sometimes people, once they get involved sexually, are uh, aroused and orgasmic. But the typical thing, let's say it healthily first and then problematically. Mm -hmm. What facilitates sexual desire is positive anticipation. You think of sex like you think about going to your favorite restaurant or museum or park or whatever. The second is the feeling that you deserve sexual pleasure in your life and in your relationship. Even if your kid is doing badly or even if you just lost your job or even if you're stressed with your partner. Mm -hmm. This sense of deserving really matters. And then the third thing that matters in terms of desire is freedom and choice. And that is if you don't have the power to say no to sex, you don't have the freedom to really embrace and say yes to sex. Right. And then last but not least is unpredictable sexual scenarios and techniques. So even if you get a couple where they have sex every Saturday night, they have four minutes of foreplay, three minutes of intercourse, two minutes of afterplay. Oh and it's fun. It's boring. It doesn't feed desire. You got to add an extra two minutes of foreplay, right? Yeah, that's how you fix it. it fixes it. <laughs> Actually... <laughs> um, I hate the word foreplay. Yeah. I love the word, word pleasuring, of giving and receiving pleasure-oriented touch. Mm -hmm. Well, because uh, I think it goes to like, you know, I think too many people want steps to sex. So like the foreplay, sex, and afterplay really is like step one. Let's do this. Step two. No, but, but sex has got to be more flexible. <laughs> right. The pleasure you give during quote unquote floor play, you still need to give that throughout sex. You still can't just, you can't go from, okay, now we're rubbing and massaging each other. And then we go into penetration. And now we just do penetration for 10 minutes. And we don't minutes. look at each other. You look off in the distance. Yeah, never like make, what happens in the movies. Never make eye contact. <laughs> Or if you do make eye contact, it's with the dog. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what movies well, you're watching. You what you're doing, right? Yeah. yeah, right? Well, you know, it depends on if your dog barges in when you're having sex. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. But, like, I think it's it gets too routine. And, and people don't realize that, like, how sexy flexible sex can be, to be honest. You know, mm -hmm. like, that, that routine, that, like, step one, step two, step three. Sex, like... It's funny because I'm actually very much like that as a therapist when it comes to certain other things. But when it comes to sex and they're like, could you just give us the bullet points? I'm like, it's not quite like that. It's you about really... getting lost in it. It is. It's and about getting lost. that's the problem with having the whole ED anxiety problem he was talking about is it's mm -hmm. harder to get lost into that with that, I'm assuming. Well, yeah, because you're like he said, when you're kind of focused and self-conscious, it, it is very difficult to get lost if you're yeah. self-conscious. That might be why somebody is asking for like, what's the step one through six? No, I know they like, struggle. <laughs> so, so if you are in that moment where you're in that anxiety of 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 ED, what's a way to get out of it? Oh yeah, good idea. Well, you know, one of the best ways of doing it as a couple it isn't just about ED, but it can be about sexual pain. It can be about huh? lack of desire. Mm is to um, switch gears and, and switch to a trust position where you feel genuinely safe, genuinely connected, and enjoy touching from that trust position where your subjective arousal is one to two or three. What's a trust and position? Then, trust position is a way where uh, different people have very different trust positions. Trust One of the most ball? interesting things about being a therapist. Uh, the most common kind of trust position is tr traditional stuff where, you know, the woman puts her head on the man's heart, the man strokes her hair, mm -hmm. and there can be nonverbal or just sort of I love you kind of talk. Or it can be active trust position where you're standing up, they're swaying with each other, they put the, one puts their hand on the other one's heart, but it's a way where you're physically connected, you're engaged in giving and receiving touch, 
and you're feeling safe with each other. So it's not the trust here. fall. <laughs> yeah, no trust falls. <laughs> it's not like you're just falling into your partner. <laughs> so it's about getting into a position that is loving and yeah, supportive. nurturing, and it's not about sexual completion. No. And you feel connected. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That actually sounds really romantic. We should dance later, Josh. <laughs> oh, yeah. You got my heart all yeah, a flutter, Barry. It's a dancing, you're right. The, the trust position is a dancing. That's right. It's a dancing. Oh, yeah. I like that. Josh, it's killing me over here. All right. No, I but that's good. It. So, like, you kind of get trusting, and then that process allows you to get more relaxed and comfortable, and then you can move back into doing some of that more subjective arousal. But it's not right. about pressuring yourself past the panic to try and, like, do oral or do a hand job or like let's just do whatever we can to keep making this work because that almost exacerbates the panic it sounds like but again there's a difference between manual and oral stimulation it's really about pleasure and eroticism which is what it's supposed to be about as opposed to manual and oral stimulation which is basically about pressuring performing and panicking Mm. so it's the exact same physical uh, stimulation but it has such a different context and a different meaning. You know, let me say two other things, because you, you guys sound like you like a little bit of controversy. So let's throw sure. a little bit Oh, of yeah, we're big on that. <laughs> so, you know, one of the most interesting things about intercourse, and again, different people do intercourse in very different ways, but the most common thing that happens in intercourse in terms of healthy sexuality is that you do multiple stimulation during intercourse. So intercourse is more than just thrusting. Mm -hmm. It's also about giving and receiving stimulation. The most common receiving stimulation for men is receiving testicle stimulation. And the second most common is receiving buttock stimulation. The third most common is receiving kissing stimulation. Mm -hmm. For women, far and away, the most common receiving is receiving clitoral stimulation. Second is receiving anal or buttock stimulation. And then the third is receiving breast stimulation. But you know the actual, the most common multiple stimulation during intercourse is is using erotic fantasies, your own private erotic fantasies. And by its nature, erotic fantasies are never socially acceptable. Never fantasize about having sex with your spouse in a missionary position in in your bedroom. Well, <laughs> I do actually. You do, do sometimes. You? Oh, that's yeah. so sweet, Josh. <laughs> You're the exception to the rule. Oh. Right? <laughs> no, but I'm a weirdo I guess. Fantasy erotic is that it's not socially desirable. Well, that's sure. it. it's a little taboo, right? I mean, what makes it's, fantasy it's hot is it's something you're not supposed to think taboo. about. <laughs> yeah, the taboo can but be... that's what makes it erotic, mm-hmm. is that it's different to real-life couple sex. Mm-hmm. And one of the worst pieces of advice that is on the internet, all over the internet, when I ask my college students, how do you spice up sex in a relationship? Everybody's hand goes up because they've read it on the internet. <laughs> you watch porn together, and you verbalize your erotic fantasies and play it out. There is no scientific evidence at all to support either of those two strategies. For most people, I thought you were going to say spanking. Fantasies but... is a good thing; it's a bridge to arousal and orgasm, but not sharing it. Oh, so having your own fantasy, but not necessarily sharing it with your partner. In fact, not sharing it with your partner in most cases. Hmm. Really? Because what you fantasize about is is. Uh, being sexual with somebody you're not supposed to be sexual with, like the next door neighbor, your minister, or uh, your brother-in-law, you <laughs> fantasize about uh, forced sex or being forced sexually. You fantasize about being watched or watching somebody. Mm-hmm. You fantasize about being sexual with somebody of the same gender. All socially non-acceptable, but what makes it erotically charged is because it's socially non-acceptable. Mm-hmm. For most of the time, when you play out your fantasies, for most people, again, one of the things that's fascinating about the sex field is you can never say these are the rules because it's not true. Mm-hmm. These are the guidelines. Yeah, it's got to be flexible suggestions. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, it's funny about what you said, Barry. Um, so, like, I actually just did a talk this weekend. I, I have an infidelity book, and, and we were, I was talking very briefly on sex addiction and, that like, how the sex therapists are completely against the sex addiction model. And, of mm-hmm. course, there's somebody in the – I'm in St. Louis, so it's the Bible Belt. So somebody had to, was a sex addiction therapist, and they had to have a debate with me for a bit. It was kind. But basically what he started talking about is, like, we get them to stop um, certain thoughts. They do this thought stopping, like, you're not allowed to fantasize about anything 
anything that's like considered problematic. Oh yeah, and I my that first that always works. Tell no, no, some, no, 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 no. Hold on. <laughs> Tell somebody to not think about a red ball. And they will think about no, but that's the point. Exactly. Like I said, why are we doing a thought police here? Like yeah. your fantasies are your own. In fact, that's the safest place to be when you're fantasizing. Mm-hmm. I would rather people have a f- complete freedom in their head and a safety there that like that's okay. That's where you get to think about all that crazy stuff. In the real world. But then in the real world, we don't act. But anytime there's like a shame associated with that natural process in your head, mm-hmm. then it's actually creates more likely like people are more likely to act crazy on it because. It's just not okay to naturally like, oh, you know what? I do want to have sex with my minister. I'm not going to, but I have a safe place in my head, a simulator, to explore Uh that. (laughs) What is this about a minister? The thing that really is the poison (laughs) people, and this is where the sex addiction people and the out-of-control male sexual behavior people agree on, is where where you combine high degrees of secrecy high degrees of eroticism and high degrees of shame. It's mm-hmm. like taking a cancer pill, a poison pill. Absolutely. It's mm-hmm. really bad for you. Yeah. But for most people, most fantasy is not socially acceptable, but it serves as a bridge to desire mm-hmm. and a bridge to arousal and orgasm. So why would you it's, not no. want to share that with your partner? Is there a, a reason? Hmm. Because it blurs the difference between fantasy and real life behavior. Mm-hmm. And it, it's also often intimidating for your partner because your partner can't be as erotic as in the fantasy, as the fantasy. Right. They might not be into your same kinks in your fantasy. Or they may be scared of them too. Right. But, but it, it's re- it, for most people, it really is anti-erotic. Because yeah. it said, I remember one couple that I treated where the man spent an enormous amount of money on um, women not being sexual with them, but the wo- women posing for him and telling erotic stories. And Hold on one second. The thing is, for most people, embrace your erotic fantasies, accept your erotic fantasies, and don't share your erotic fantasies. Okay. Huh. Don't share them. Keep it to yourself, yeah. Angela. Uh, <laughs> well, I like sharing our fantasies, but I think you and I are kind of on the same wavelength about it, so it works out. Like, I do sure. think some couples can, but you both have to be very open sexually, and you probably have to test the waters a little bit, too. Like, most people, mm-hmm. if you put out the most extreme fantasy, you're definitely going to have, like, a problem with it. But if you start with a little feeler, I call them, like, mm-hmm. little, you know, like, put a little feeler out. Like, say, oh, I just like the idea of public sex then like see where that goes and if it doesn't go well then it's like okay well that's my own fantasy <laughs> exactly anyway let's move on to uh cognitive behavioral therapy for sexual dysfunction this is a book you wrote uh can you tell us a little bit about that well uh, this is actually is a very complicated story my colleague i wrote four lay public books with him his name was michael metz mm-hmm. and michael died uh, in 2012 and, when, and before he died, he asked me to make sure that this book, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Sexual Dysfunction, was is really his life work. Everything he ever thought about, about sex, about couples, about spirituality, was in that book. Mm-hmm. And he said, please make sure it gets published. And it took a tremendous amount of rewriting, and but it finally got published in 2017. And it's a book for clinicians. I think it's a very good book about how to work with couples and combine couple work, sex work, uh, and making meaning. I'm not a religious or spiritual person, Michael was, uh, but certainly some of his suggestions are really good ones. But it's not for the lay public. Mm-hmm. For It's for professionals. Sure. The best book that he ever wrote for the lay public was called Enduring Desire, and I was the second author, about how to keep sexual desire alive in ongoing relationships. How do you keep it alive? I think it's, it's this idea, again, of not taking it for granted, making sure that you put time, energy, thought, communication into your sexual relationship, whether you've been a couple for five years, 25 years, or 50 years. Mm-hmm. Never rest on your laurels sexually. <laughs> Everyone things into it. 
Well, that's principle one of the good enough sex model, right? You have to be intentionally erotic and as a team. And it's both of your responsibility to keep up that eroticism. (laughs) Do I have to do work? Both of you need to have both an intimate voice and an erotic voice. Mm -hmm. And here's another concept that I don't think is talked about very much, but is really important. For most couples, their couple sexual style is different than their relational style. There is really good science that says for most couples, again, whether partnered or uh, married, whether they're straight or gay, that the best friend relational style is the best fit. But it's not the best fit sexually. So you've got to find a sexual style that allows each of you to keep your own sexual voice, but to function together as an intimate and erotic sexual team. And that's what the challenge is. So what are the different sexual styles? I'm not sure I quite understand Well, that. one of them, the one that we advocate for, for most couples, not, again, not all, is called a complementary sexual style, where you're well bonded, but you're not clones of each other. You have a different way of initiating than your partner does. You have a different pleasuring scenario than your partner does. You have a different way, a preferred way of having intercourse than your partner does, and you have a different orgasmic pattern. Hmm. So it it allows you to keep your own individuality, but feel like you're an intimate sexual team, because ultimately sex is a team sport. Mm -hmm. And then another couple sexual style... Go Falcons. (laughs) Another couple sexual style is the traditional style. What's the idea that men are about initiation and intercourse frequency, women are about intimacy and relational security. So they both know their roles Mm -hmm. and it plays for them. Another sexual style is the best friend where you really are very close to each other, very intimate with each other, you hang out with each other. The problem with the best friend style is that you de-eroticize each other. Yeah, I call that friend zoning. You put them in the friend zone. You don't realize it, but you can friend zone your own partner. It's so weird. How dare you? <laughs> and the biggest thing is you de-eroticize your partner and de-eroticize the relationship. How, do, how, what do you mean? How does that happen? And I what think is it? It because there's so much emphasis on intimacy and so much emphasis on mutuality that you don't take emotional sexual risks with each other, mm. that you're only sexual when you're both on the same page. And that the truth of the matter is that there's many different ways and, and reasons to initiate sex and very different sexual experiences. Hmm. So you only have mutual, serious, intimate sexual experiences, and you wind up seeing them as, I love my spouse, but I'm not in love with my spouse. Hmm. That's the danger. And then... Interesting. The most controversial sexual style is the more adventuresome sexual style called emotionally expressive. And that is where you emphasize eroticism more than intimacy. You take risks. Those are the couples who are more likely to uh, have non-traditional agreements like consensual non-monogamy instead of traditional monogamy. But what I always say to couples is you've got to choose first your right relational style and then your right sexual style. Because in an ideal world, a relationship is satisfying first, secure second, and that the role of sex is that 15 to 20% role of energizing your bond and allowing you to feel desire and desirability. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I'm just like, now I'm just thoughtful. <laughs> like, I'm thinking of, if I work, you can't think on a podcast. You're supposed to talk. It's time just, to think, Angela. No, I know. It just, he has this way of getting you, like, in your head, like, wow, what what does it mean for our sexual style? Yeah. Because, like, we when when you said it's good to be best friends, me and my husband, we did this high five. We're best friends. <laughs> and, and then he said, the but it's one. bad for sex. And I was like, oh, no, are we, oh, but no, no, we have a great sex life. It's just, it's interesting to know that there are those differences. And you can't see them, obviously, in your couples. Like, I have plenty of couples who will say to me, we're best friends but we just have this one area that we struggle with and it's Mm -hmm. in our sex life and it's usually when they're great friends they're the kindest people in the world but one thing josh says to me that i love and i actually use in my talks is sometimes when you're being nice you're actually being mean Mm -hmm. and what it means is is like you're being so nice that you're not being assertive about what you want you're not being honest you're not being honest so like when it comes to sex for example you're oh oh she's maybe not interested so i'm not even going to try it's being nice 
But like that being nice over time creates this distance for couples. It becomes like a tyranny of mutuality. Mm-hmm. Instead of mutual, I'm always in favor of mutuality. Uh huh. But not tyranny. No. <laughs> That's an interesting Every, word. All sex has to be mutual, or all sex has to be intimate. <clears throat> That's a mistake. Well, and it's not that hot. Let's be fair. I mean, mutual sex can be hot, but you know what's really hot is when you're interested and you just say, hey, let's do this. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, that's sexy. Yeah. And it's not always that I was into it in that moment, but like, it's it's that d- drawing each other out of each other. There's a little bit of a push and pull that's exciting mm-hmm. about sex that if you lose that and you're all like, oh, no, maybe they're not in a perfect space or maybe we're not exactly where we need to be. We just can't even approach this topic. So you think that's healthier if sometimes one partner is more driven for it you're not always mutually aroused and on the same page that's correct that is that's the whole idea of asynchronous sex and you want to accept asynchronous sex rather than demand that all sex be mutual and intimate because ultimately that hurts (laughs) desire Yeah, yeah, but it doesn't mean you're not in a process of building desire with each other because also if you're not doing that sex that's just very like A, B, C, you, it's, it's this process. So yeah, maybe you're not quite there yet, but that excitement of somebody really wanting it can draw you in, but then there's still this right. building of pleasure and eroticism that can still get you to an awesome end goal. <laughs> but, you know, one of the ways of saying it to people is that in terms of your preferences, let's say somebody has, one of you has a scenario where in your preference is it's a, an eight and a subjective arousal or nine or even a 10. And for your partner, it's not that much of a turn on. It's more like a three or a four. They get turned on because you're turned on. That's perfectly mm-hmm. no, healthy. Hmm. Yeah, that's responsive desire. Is if it's a t- nine or ten for one partner and it's a minus five for the other. Yeah. <laughs> where if sex feels coercive, that yeah. kills desire. Oh, yeah, where they're almost well, pressuring you. And coercion is really bad for sexual desire. Oh, no, that's a big turn off. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. Like, what, we'll see that pattern when a couple come in where that, like, it, usually it's the guy, but it can be the girl, too, to be fair. But, like, maybe the guy's like, you never want to have sex. What's wrong with you? Everybody else wants to have sex. Everybody's having sex all the time. Why don't you act like other people? It's very, <laughs> it is. It's pressure. Why, and it's, why aren't you other people? Well, it's critical. It, that's <laughs> yeah. actually, it's basically sexual criticism that right. is um, making them feel like terrible Nobody people. You're wants, not a sexual person. Nobody wants to be complained into sex. Oh, no. It's the most... And yet, that's the model some men take. That's the model many men take. (laughs) I think it's because we don't get educated on how to do this, though. Like, I mean, a lot of people are doing this through trial by fire. Nobody ever taught me how to sex. Nobody taught you. (laughs) Like, they'll teach you in school, they'll teach you the mechanics of this is the penis, this is the vagina. They'll teach you hygiene. And you do the hokey pokey and you're done. (laughs) Like, they'll teach you the hygiene, they'll teach you... They'll scare the crap out of you with all the pictures of STDs and all that. But oh, yeah. They won't actually talk about any of this stuff. Like, this exactly. is really important and stuff for sex. Like, I know, <laughs> I know you teach it in college, but the reality is, like, this stuff should be taught about in middle school. Like, they should be learning about responsive desire and erectile dysfunction and all these things that they're going to come up in your life. And the only time a lot, of, a lot of people, that's the only time they have really listen to any education like people don't pay attention in college maybe not all of it in seventh grade but like maybe across the time you know (laughs) right certain things at different levels yeah like like nobody ever talks about all this stuff Mm -hmm. well that's why we have a job at least it's job security for me and barry (laughs) nobody talks about how to initiate sex exactly with your partner when nobody ever talked about that to me i kind of had to figure it out i was just like okay let's do it yeah, I think you're just supposed to like take their hand and say, hey, you want to bang? <laughs> that yeah. works, right? Yeah, it does. <laughs> Excuse me, madam. Would you like to copulate? Uh, oh, yeah, that's a good way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, the ladies are all in a flutter with that. Oh, they love that type. No, this is really good stuff, though, Barry. So, like, you know, we're kind of getting towards the end of the show, and so I'm curious if there was any, like, final things you'd want any like other topics? Any, any either final topics or even just final things you want people to know, like, that would help them in their sex life. Well, you know, I think you know, one of the most valuable concepts in all of sexuality is the idea that you, whether you're 17 or you're 47 or 77, you want to take this pro-sexual stance that sex is a good thing in life and not a bad thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That is integral to who you are as a female or who you are as a male. And that the question is, at this point in your life and at this point in your relationship, is sex playing that healthy 15 to 20 percent role in your life or is it playing a destructive role 
can, if it's playing a destructive role, to sense that you deserve for sex to have a positive role in your life. And that you can use all your resources, including therapy, to learn that. And I do think that couple therapy is so much more effective in the long run than individual therapy in terms of people's sexual relationships. Yeah. I agree with that. (laughs) Oh, yeah. You don't have sex alone. Why would you have sex? Or you can, but (laughs) you don't have sexual dysfunction alone. Let's say that. Well, so, Barry, is there any final thing you want to plug as far as either a book or something coming up in, in your professional world? Well, I was just in St. Louis, so I can't plug St. Louis again. Mm-hmm. Probably, again, if, if somebody were to say to me, for, if, there's, if I'm having sexual problems, of all the things you've written, what's the most valuable book? It would be Rekindling Desire. Okay. Rekindling if you ask desire. me what's the best way of preventing sexual problems and keeping sex alive, it would be the book that we wrote with Mike Metz called Enduring Desire. Hmm. Okay. Enduring Desire. Okay. Okay, Sounds so good. this has been Barry McCarthy. And then, of course, if you want to see me, I'm Angela Skirtu. You can find me at www.therapistinstlouis.com. And I wrote the book, Helping Couples Overcome Infidelity, a therapist manual. You want to go ahead and read uh, this? Be sure to add us on Facebook, review us on iTunes, and send us your questions to aboutsexpodcast at gmail.com. I'm Joshua Skirtu. And I'm Angela Skirtu. Stay, Stay kinky, kinky, St. Louis. Louis.